Okay. <laughs> we do the spontaneous one. So, um, hi, Paula. Welcome. Hi. Mark, welcome. Hey. Hey, right, so good to see everyone. Hi. Hi, Mark. <laughs> so, these topics, they just somehow come up, and apparently, grief was on the front burner. And I, I think in, in uh, these times at the moment, we can, as Jana just said, also experience so many forms of grief. It doesn't have to be what we right away perceive as grieving for a loved one or um, for many different situations in life, such as your, your health or your, your loss of your home or freedom or whatever it might be, um, there are so many themes within the big theme which continue to be on a personal level. Um, I have spoken to many people and I wrote it actually down two days ago and it's, it's unbelievable what is going on on an individual level for people at the mm -hmm. moment, additionally to the corona situation. And um, I, I thought about way back in 1990 when my father and my brother died and I was before that introduced to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and that back then really saved me. She, she uh, not only helped me to understand about the different stages of grieving with her studies, which first were five, five stages of grieving, which you might be aware of, and then later became seven stages of grieving. So um, the shock, um, denial, anger, bargaining, uh, depression, testing, and then the acceptance. But um, she, had a, she had a little book. I don't even know if it's available in English or any other language, but in Germany it was available. And it was her summarizing um, the study she has done with blind people who had uh, experienced death and she, she was um, um, taking notes of what they experienced before they would go and what they would have as a vision. And then she also did studies with blind mm -hmm. people who had a near-death experience. And what they would say in that near-death experience, what would happen in their surrounding, in their room, and in the near-death experience. And this little book I cherished so much that was in 1988, 1989. And when my father had terminal cancer, I would read him out of this book and uh, assure him that there would be something greater to go to when he is leaving this body, which was very difficult for him because he had a very conflicted and difficult life. So I'm, I'm mentioning that because I was thinking about the different stages. I was thinking about what is going on for people with whom I uh, choose to share my experience and my time or who, who call me or email me. And there is so much fear and so much, so many shifts first from the shock and the panic and then towards the uncertainty. And now we are indeed also in the stage of grieving. So in other words, we are going in a way through all these stages as if there is a grieving or a loss uh, process in our individual lives. And yes, there is. I mean, some people are diagnosed with cancer or some other people have lost people. And what I noticed is, for example, I spoke to a friend of mine um, whom who lost her father the day before I, I called her and lost her kind of substitute mom, substitute mom five days before her father died. Mm -hmm. And our conversation was not about the two major people she lost and that she wasn't able to say farewell. She wasn't permitted to go to the hospital. She wasn't permitted to go even to the funeral because they would only allow five people. So all these are different topics to deal with within the grieving process but she continued for half an hour just 
to share her concern how she would survive this and how hopefully she doesn't lose her house over this and she doesn't know where to relocate if so and she's afraid that she or her husband could get it etc et so the preoccupation with how to survive this with the uh, uncertainty is so great that um, there there is for me a loss of the stages of of grieving and there is not even room to really thoroughly look at what is happening in the moment which means my father and my mom died and yet i'm i'm in panic i'm still running inside of me and what is fusing what hmm, has to be discovered but um so i'm i'm just realizing how much more is there to it and how we need to find a way um to cope with the grief and i would like to put out like we did the last times a, a, a discussion a talk about it what i'm sure you you came in with something which is on your mind or with something you would like to share or <coughs> you experience it and you're surrounding with someone else who is in any kind of grief at the moment i mean you might grieve that i mean i'm grieving that we are not home for example mm -hmm. is that a big grief no it's not and i mean i you know whatever health issues or is that on the front burner at the moment it's not but what is happening to the pressure within you when you have to suppress all these smaller griefs uh or the uncertainty and also for me i would like to put out into the discussion um what is if the grief or the pain or the uncertainty of the now becomes so unbearable that we don't want to do the present thing anymore like jana said we are all learning what can be used for our clients but what can be also used for ourselves um, usually we are saying we want to live the now and from now to now but what happens if you are in a situation or one of your loved ones is in a situation um where the now is just something you want to disassociate from you want to get away from and how do you handle that um that is something i would like to open up and have a few words from whoever would like to share their thoughts about this um, how you could either assist yourself or rescue yourself, whatever it might be, uh, or someone else with whom you go through an experience of deep pain, deep loss, deep shock, wherever that might be in that moment. So I would be happy to... You mean how do you handle your... your so what, what do you do if the now is unbearable? Uh -huh. That is the question. Mm -hmm. what, what if the now, if you are in a now which is unbearable, or if you are assisting someone who is in a now which is unbearable, such as two dear friends of us, he has terminal cancer on top of everything else. So how do you handle that? What is your suggestion? Who would can, like I, to can, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I can start. Um, I just unmuted myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest grieving I have right now is that a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of other people that are dear to me are grieving, and they are grieving because um, mostly of the loss of the freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, first it was of course uh, fear for the health, and now mostly. Um, the uh, the loss of freedom especially for their children which need who need uh, development and you know mm -hmm. and are not able because they're all constricted and there is this yeah. internal um internal uh, resistance to what is at the moment which is probably also very similar feeling with the resistance to accepting what is when you lose your home, the, your job, your loved one. No. So it's a it's a similar mm -hmm. yeah, it's very uh difficult. And for me it's um I, I don't you know I, I'm always using you know Eckhart Tolle saying you know all the stress is only because you're comparing your your current situation 
with your past situation or with the expectation of the few of the future but when people are like you wouldn't you wouldn't say that to the person who comes for therapy for you with you and you say excuse me i'll, I'll give you all the wisdom right now because they're really there yeah. because they cannot handle the now mm -hmm. they cannot yeah. let go of the past they cannot stop worrying about the future so for me i think this um this meeting is going to be very useful to really find courage or more to find courage to lead a person through surrender because i think when there are whether it's grieving or anger or any other emotion that is displeasing what worked for me the most is when i instead of resisting it i surrender to it and i just watch it and once i give it full room to express itself it starts to dissipate mm -hmm. and of course it's good if you have someone to do it with like a therapist or a friend or a relative who can actually hold space but yep. sometimes you just have to hold space for yourself that's, what, that's what we're doing for each other here now right yeah and the holding space also means sometimes we're really just sitting listening and you you can't do anything you, you're just really holding the space you're yeah. just a soundboard you're just an active listener or even a not active listener yeah okay. by being death in particular and grief in general we don't talk about we're supposed to be happy we're supposed to be this we're supposed to be that but and then but we don't talk about it and i think talking about it whether there's a solution or not is, is so important right i think even i had to think about it myself and when we selected this topic and um started discussing it before our meetings as we do i thought well no one close to me has died from this i'm not really grieving you know and we start to compare our grief. I, sh I shouldn't be grieving. They are. I'm not. I, I should be above that. But I realized I'm really grieving too. I mean, the life I've known for many, many years since we've been together, it doesn't exist anymore. You can't fly on planes like I did all the time. I used to joke and say, when people asked me where I lived, I would say 10D. That was the seat I preferred on the, on the plane usually, right? But traveling like that, I don't know if it ever comes back. And I realized there's a sadness in me that I'm not in my home in Jersey City. I'm not flying around the country teaching the way I did. And I, I thought, well, I shouldn't be sad about that. It's, it's not death. I don't, you know, people aren't, I haven't lost someone close to me. But it's really a sad thing. And, and I think it's exactly what you said, Jean. I, what I came to was Eckhart Tolle also, that, that wanting things to be different than they are. You know, diving into that pain body or that pain body that he talks about being activated, it's easy to slip into that. And that'll a little later today, we'll do a practice around that. But that was some of my own mm, exploration of my my grief. And yeah, let's let's ask the next person that wants to share about theirs mm -hmm. and how they deal with it to come up. Let's see, Mark, did you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is not necessarily me and some from the past, but it, it does have to do with grief. So um, my parents were married for 56 years when my mom passed. Mm. And and six years later, my dad passed. Mm. And a lot of times, you know, it might be shorter than that. But uh, about a month before my dad passed, I was reading this article on Tom Kenyon's website mm -hmm. called Emotional Cancer. And he talked about how emotions create physical problems with the body my dad got pulmonary fibrosis the doctor said how much do you smoke i don't smoke well how long did you how many years did you smoke i never smoked <clears throat> one of the things that tom mentioned in the article was sorrow and grief tends to manifest in the lungs oh, and yeah. different emotions manifest in different parts of the body mm -hmm. and so i'm convinced that that's that's what happened to my dad because they had been married for so long and knew each other mm -hmm. for so long yeah. and he just couldn't he couldn't move past that so it that's just what came up you know for me when you know when y'all were talking about yeah. about that 
Mm. So it's it's important. There's many many things, uh, many emotional reactions. Is one of the first things I learned in hip, in my hypnosis class was that about the emotions manifesting in physical in the body. So so when you can deal with those emotions and like this, like talking about it, bring it up, you can you can bypass the you know the the other things that might come to to slap you around down the road. So it's important. It is important to to work through and 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 in our case, a lot of us to help others to you know to work through, just like just like the two you're doing. So thanks. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Me too, I'm raised. I, I think it's really very valid what you say. Um, the immune system, everything. I mean, it, it manifests in our physical body and and additionally to it in the emotional or spiritual body but i think in in the pain it's it's not possible to figure out what is spiritually going on what what does my soul want to teach me with all this i i definitely think the concern has to be to share to have support to have people with whom we can uh feel safe to do so because one thing i experienced in grieving processes and maybe you all can verify that is that people alienate themselves they don't know how to handle you they tiptoe mm. around you they walk to the other side of the street and don't even greet because they're like oh my god i mean she's in her mid-20s she she just lost her father what am i going to say to her and i took back then i took it personally but now of course with all the other things which happened in my life i understand completely that they're as much as I am in some sort of denial or they think I should be like that or I could have or whatever, whatever happens. And that can manifest, of course, later on in the physical if we don't move through it and if we don't have the support to move through it. And it, it can also get stuck in, in, in depression like you shared, my dad couldn't get beyond the grief. So what does the depression do then? physically mm -hmm. and so i think it's it's really important to to look at it and as paul said to make it a topic especially now it, it's part of our life we cannot suppress it it's there and even if it's not someone dying it, it's closing the office it's having financial issues it's losing your home whatever it might be what is going on at the moment so people had their hands up. Like to, to, did you want to say okay. something? Okay. Um, let me unmute you. Yeah, she's driving. I'm, I'm in the car, so I hope you can hear me. Be careful, please. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. The roads are empty. Leave me in Israel. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you for bringing the topic up because I think it really resonates with the Topic, topic you just discussed uh, last week uh, to trust and mm. uh, let go and also I have three friends that are um, they are going through a grieving process um, three different things. but I feel that grief is such a, an everyday subject I'm also a fan of Kobleros but um, I think that the grief is starting to be part of your life when you realize, uh, when I realize that the life is full of change and you cannot stop it. And that every time you think you have something sure, the next thing happened and you have to grieve again. And I feel that uh, for myself, uh, it really changed my life when I understood I can grieve upon things that are not even past that it releases me from some kind of uh, attachment that cause, causes suffering as for myself so yeah. i feel it's a really important topic and uh, yeah and, and much more an everyday topic because even for your friends i think who is maybe have terminal uh, cancer he could be grieving upon different things about upon the relationship he doesn't have and not necessarily upon um the cancer or being that or being dead maybe that's the 
the, the duty of the per people who stays to grieve upon, but usually people who face like terminal, um, um, I don't know, diseases, they grieve upon, not necessarily upon life, but on everyday subject as yeah. we all. So yeah. I feel it's a really cool. <clears throat> Oh, true. And the change was one of the key words. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because you, you, you know, you, and you come to a conclusion today, but tomorrow it changed again. And the outside yeah. forces <laughs> you to look to another yet maybe painful situation. Yeah. yeah. Ollie's had her thank hand you. up for a while. Let's see if we yeah. can. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Oops. Well, I think this is going to be a little bit more personal sharing because I'm going through something at the moment that mm -hmm. is uh, provoking a lot of grief in me. I mean, I think it shows because I'm, uh, I've, uh, this lockdown has uh, brought to the surface some memories that I had to work on mm -hmm. from childhood that I couldn't access before. Yeah. I was too. And it has to deal with abuse. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm in, a pro in processing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with a therapist who is an expert on not, I mean, I, I was directed to her because it was, um, I was told that she's an expert in ritual abuse. And um, um, I'm working with other people. I'm talking to people about it, but it's it's hard for me to. It's not the first time that I'm experiencing grief. And when I came to the to the training, my mom died in like 15 days before that. So we, I I had to face some grieving. Um, but this is a different kind of shock because mm -hmm. it's um, everything I know about my family and about who I think that my family is, and. Um, yeah, it's it's being like sort of taken away from me, uh, which is not a bad thing that things like that are coming up to the surface, but it's uh, it it takes a lot of personal strength to go through that. No, I, I want to tell you that you're not alone. There are many people with what's happening now, mm -hmm. with this virus and the lockdown and isolation. It's re-triggering mm -hmm. and bringing to the surface old trauma. Mm -hmm. I, I had a message from someone two days ago, I was supposed to have a meeting with and she could not attend the meeting because of the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. right? And so you're, you're not alone with it. And yeah, I think that's why it's important that we reach out to each other too. Yeah, it's, but it's not only about personal thing, you know, because mm -hmm. everything I've learned so far from mm -hmm. my education and from even training with you, it kind of gives a different spotlight to that because yep. I have to relearn things. I mean, what happens with my my free choice and what is this, the choice of my soul? I mean, I work a lot of, with people who are having similar experiences and I know mm -hmm. I how to work with them, but you know, when I have to deal with, with myself, <laughs> it's sort of I have to watch myself uh, as a from an observer position, which is hard for me at, at this moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, working with people who are working, uh, who are energy healers, for instance, at the moment helps helps me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Working with people who are working with a sound healing, like four, three, two hertz. Like mm -hmm. I'm working with somebody in Ireland. Like she, her name is Stella. She sings, she chants and sings, and that her music helps a lot. And uh, that actually instigated, which is actually triggering me on the path of discovery who I really am, because who I thought I am, I'm not. Yeah. And everything I thought about my lineage is not true. It's something else, which is not bad. It's good. But I have to go through this process of uncovering yeah. all that's been hidden. Mm -hmm. And it's not nice. Thanks, that's sir. not nice. Thanks for being brave to share that. Yeah. There's 20, over 20 therapists yeah. online here. Maybe that's, I think that I'm going to be called in a certain moment to speak more openly about it. So this is yeah. why I'm, okay. I, this is why I'm doing it. Thank you for sharing. Thank that. you, Ollie. Brave. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Franklin's waving. 
Yeah. Yes. Do we have to? Do we have to oh, do, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, as a as a doctor, I've seen a lot of grief with people. Yeah. So for myself, I became uh, a dissociate, dissociate, dissociation artist, which mm. means uh, I stepped mm -hmm. out. I could see all these things, and I, in a way, I I could build a wall to survive. Uh, it helped me. It's also helped for, for people if someone stands for them. But bring it to myself, um, during last years, I um, I am trying to open myself m more from the heart. And mm. that's, uh, uh, that's a learning process. Mm -hmm. uh, and also to the lady before, um, I, I work also with energy psychology for 20 years or so. And, um, uh, if someone happens, it all it all comes to the physical, and if you go to the physical, there's the information, there's the answer, and from there you can build up. And also working with energy has also a spiritual aspect. It is it's it's, it's inherent because uh, but it, it, I started the basis, but nowadays I'm starting here by <laughs> myself. That's what I wanted to share. But uh, uh, I know that a lot of doctors. Uh, to survive, they, they they have to because it does, otherwise they couldn't 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 stand up. They would uh, always they flew away. You yeah. know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we spoke to actually several uh, people on the front line. I, just yesterday, I spoke to someone, and um, you have to somehow disassociate a part of yeah. you because otherwise how, how can you possibly continue yeah. 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 anyone else dealing with grief and or patients or clients with grief and you want to share your how you handle it or how you don't handle it yeah I will um, Paul we uh, lost uh, an uncle in Italy through the coronavirus. Mm. But in our family, there's been so much grief that, um, as Franklin said, you sometimes just yeah. sort of just, just build a layer around you because, uh, oh, I'm looking back 30 years now, um, my entire mum's family were wiped out within 18 months. They just died of different causes. And in that same time, I was running a daycare center and I lost a, a little four month old through cot death, uh, oh. four months after my mom died. So it took me a year after all that to just crash. Um, I was getting, as Mark said, you, you build up physical symptoms. Uh, and I went in for hearing loss, mental med it had everything linked to the grief mm -hmm. that I had been going through. And then when I was on the course in October, my um, very dear friend, we grew up like sisters, she had terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, a month later, <clears throat> after I got back, uh, she did pass away. But what I found in that wasn't her grief. Her, she was angry at first. But it was more to do with, for me, it's the grieving of the people around the people that have terminal illness. Because eventually that person who has terminal illness gets to an acceptance that they're leaving. Mm. But what I've had a hard time with is the family members that are dealing with her loss. But she had a hard time dealing with their anger. Yeah. While well, she knew she was dying. Absolutely. She and arrived at acceptance and the pe people around her don't, yeah. And that's a huge thing, I think, for all of us as therapists to remember it's not just the person's self, but they're also battling trying to calm everybody down around them. Mm -hmm. The very big point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a relatively new book on the scene by, I think he's a Dutch doctor, um, Vander Kolk, 
called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yeah. And okay, it's really about this. And he's doing a free program um, called Cracked Up. I think it's in a few days, but you might, you might research it. Um, he's a specialist in trauma and has some pretty sad and scary stories, but he is one of the top experts, I think, in, in resolving trauma and talking about how it's held in the body and how to release it. You might take a look at that. The body keeps the score. Yeah. I want to share something. The yeah, fabulous, yeah. great. Yeah. So, um, is it Ilsa? Is that your name? Is that how you say it? Yeah. So you brought up in my mind just what I've seen in person is that people that are often going through a dying process wait to you know their loved ones are usually hovering around them wanting to spend as much time as possible and then it's often when they've left the room that those people mm -hmm. they go you know they feel like yeah there's a knowingness i think to the time that they leave and um so it's very much an interrelated process like you were saying they're they're balancing a lot of factors not only their own you know acceptance of their of their crossing but yesterday i came across a ted talk and there was this guy there was an emt i think and he said that over the years he saw he helped many people through car accidents to and different different uh serious situations to uh that were crossing basically on the on the scene and he said at first he thought that w what the best option for him to do would be to tell them everything's going to be okay even though it yeah. wouldn't be and then later he realized there was one case later, many years after um, going through this process with people that he realized that what people really needed was that they, I think it was a specific case where there was a bike accident and the, he was talking to them and he was considering, should I, should I tell him, you know, everything will be okay, even though he knew the time, which they have a specific name for it. It's, forget the, the, the work name for that, that knowingness of the EMT that it's going to end. But he realized talking to this guy that basically everybody wants, if they're more accepting of the truth than, I, than the people yeah. that are staying. And that what people really want and need to know is that they're going to be remembered and that they did something meaningful with their lives. So those are the two things that give mm. people an acceptance mm -hmm. to, that mm. it's okay, that they'll be remembered. Like, is this guy in the bike accident looked at him and said, will you remember me? And, um, and, you know, he was also saying something about how I didn't, um, I, you know, I didn't do anything meaningful with my life. And it happened to be that this person adopted two children that were in medical school at the time. So, you know, looking back on it, this person had given the opportunity for two children to come into the world and to be paid to go to medical school to help many other people. So the meaning was immense, but, um, just about understanding that I think so I thought that was uh interesting and to agree I think just coming across that video yesterday and then all sorts of stuff dealing with with grief and death these days I think it's so prevalent um it's in our country it's I don't know about anywhere else but like you were saying earlier it's so common not to face death and to ignore it and I think it's a huge problem and it's really holding us back from growing up um <laughs> For myself, I know because I've, you know, Paul and Sophia know I've dealt with breath, uh, death at an early age in my family and uh, also losing a partner for a long time. So it's an ongoing process. But I think one thing I've realized through this down period is that for so many years I had this like forward movement, this like active, mm -hmm. active forward mm -hmm. movement, almost like young, young energy. And I was just like pushing. And right now, as we're forced to like sit and be still, yep. I'm finding that all of that is I'm like pushing. being, yeah, it stopped pushing and I'm realizing how I've been doing that for so long. And it's like so much is just melting and I'm becoming so tender, like things are moving me. I mean, both sad things in the world that are happening and beautiful things are moving me so much these days as I'm melting and softening and letting myself be that tender, letting that tenderness come forward. So. I think it's a really important process. Um, hugely significant in my view. Yeah, thank you, Travis. And uh, it's it's uh, it's really true. There is no such thing as running anymore. Now it's facing. 
I think yeah. we're all much more in the being than in the doing these days. Mm -hmm. And it's a, mm -hmm. it can be a scary place to be, but it's a wonderful place to be too. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a, a friend of ours, we spent quite a bit of time with him on the phone, on the, a Zoom meeting the other day, who's working on a, mm -hmm. a book that'll be out next year. And for he's um, worked in hospice for a long time, a Zen, Zen hospice. And uh, he's got a project called a Shared Crossing Project. And it has really fantastic stories of friends and family experiencing um, conscious death with, with a loved one and contact with, with the dying both before and after their death um, with some really good research, uh, has quite a bit about grieving and um, well, some of the miraculous things that happen around it, if we're just conscious and connected with it rather than in denial and ignoring it. So shared crossings, you might, you might look online for that. It's a beautiful project and some great research on it too. I just want to share a story with regards to um, I call, I call her my sister, Jackie had passed uh, a week before her passing. Um, it was as if the conscious mind, everything had separated then already because she literally through the night, it was as if she came through to me and she said she wanted to go see, and I, I couldn't get the name of the place, something um, I had to cross the sea and it was as if I was flying. I had her under my arms and, um, we flew all night and she kept saying everything's going to be okay i'm just i just want to go to that place mm. and when we reached there just almost movement over the sea was the sun was coming up and i said to her we here and as i looked down she had died in my arms okay. mm. and then a week later she crossed over mm -hmm. so it was as if she was separating herself to make me feel better because I couldn't be with her because she's all was all the way in South Africa mm. so it's it helped me through the process a lot knowing that she had actually come to me before her passing to say it was okay to let go thank you Elsa. yeah thank you I think we have time for one more. Should we do this one? Yeah. Okay. okay. We just had to clarify because we had two and so, Peter? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Would you like to do a inner journey which you could follow for yourself if you would choose to or um, are you? I'm just going to use the restroom. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> just want you to know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Travis. Anybody else who would like to share something or can I start with a practice? Okay, good. All right, so let's do that. So just um, center yourself. Take a deep breath. And if you choose to close your eyes to go inward and just connect with what we just talked about and what came up for you and connect with something which is causing you sadness or despair or grief And take a moment and notice how your mind is responding to the details of the sadness or the grief or the despair, which we can also call the story or the storyline of that feeling and experience. can be questions even such as what will be going on in my life? What will 
my life be like? As much as you can, calm your mind and step out of the past and out of the projection into the future. Calm your mind and drop any fantasy or imagination of the past or future. And notice what is happening in your body as you breathe yourself a bit more into your body if you can. And if you would like to notice if you can place a hand on your heart And placing the hand on your heart, be really, really gentle with yourself. And hold yourself or your heart as if you are holding a very vulnerable, very, very precious being or baby, maybe your own little one, inner little one, your own little one, the self. Or notice if your heart is capable of letting go of some protection or if it even is protected. Just go into that communication. And notice what is happening in your mind when you do that. And if your mind can even drop more of the story, the what if, the why, and allow yourself to feel the waves which might come up of sadness or grief, whatever it might be, layer by layer, wave by wave, and let these feelings th flow through you connecting to above, whatever above is for you, the spirit realm, the universe, connecting to the below. And let these feelings flow through you and release to the above and the below or the below and the above, whatever you feel, release and breathe and move it through your body, releasing. And maybe notice where in your physical body you're holding the sadness or grief and pay some additional Notice and attention to that place and become even more gentle with yourself. Holding your heart, holding the self-love. Noticing the body responding maybe with some tingling or some additional notice of pain. And breathe and release. And maybe ask questions such as, what do I need? And who or what can assist me? Or do I need to let go or say farewell to someone or something? And take that time to do this now. And breathing and connecting to compassion for yourself. And slowly integrating your sadness or your loss and feeling kindness and compassion 
as much as you can. Noticing your mind, noticing your breath, your body. Reminding yourself that as a soul, you are growing through this experience. And if you can, if you're capable, and if you are having the resource, let this kindness and compassion flow out to others around you and flow out to the grief you might feel and experience in the world and release also that release to the above and be below and notice how we are not in control letting go sending out as much as you can from your center from your love the healing for the global for the bigger realm And then noticing again your heart and your breathing and your connection to the above, to something greater and the below, staying in the flow, bringing it back to you and your eternal experience. And breathing yourself into this moment, back into our group, into our circle. Taking with you what is important and continuing to release what wants to be released. Over the time to come. Centering yourself and coming back into the now. And when you're ready, just open your eyes and come back into the circle. Thank you. Thank you all for being brave to have incarnated during this time. And share planet Earth with your experience. So who would like to share something? Is someone ready to do so? Unmute yourself if you want to share something. Maybe it takes a moment before you're ready to do Can you hear me well? Yes, no, no. Um, I, when we started talking about this, um, I just realized that um, since very young, I've been through a lot of grief. Yeah. And through a lot of loss um, in different situations. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> this could be a good uh, topic for the next LBL session. Like why did I choose so much uh, accumulated, uh, so much grief and loss over the short period of time? Because I always felt, even when I was very young, that I, like I'm 80 years old, I always felt so old. And uh, and now you know, um, I when Ilse was sharing um, this about her friend, um, 
I was going to share about this very similar thing that happened with my past. And we were like 2,500 kilometers away. Mm. And uh, I just felt um, like unease and, and nervousness just in the moment. And I said, I have to call home. And then my father said, she just passed away. Mm. And, that, and then, I, then, then I knew that she came to say goodbye yeah. and to say she's fine. And, um, and it helped me a lot. It helped me. Uh, first of all, it opened a whole, um, whole new world for me. But it helped me a lot to to understand and not to not to grieve the loss. Like I will never see her again. But knowing that she's there and we will meet again, and this is all part of the plan. And um, so it was. It was. It was beautiful. That's interesting. <laughs> about my choice yeah, yeah. thank you oh, very much though mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah thank you sonetta for sharing someone else anybody else Jana? i um i want to um add as well that i think um what um uh who was it uh ilsa ilsa i don't know how to pronounce it said that this kind of releasing and saying goodbye and uh, is is a very important part to um alleviate uh grie grieving and i think as therapists mm -hmm. we are we have the tools to make that encounter if it hasn't happened in real life Yep. And it's an important part. And no one time in my practice has it happened that there was blame or there was rejection on the other side of the loved one for something that was it, normally it's a beautiful encounter which releases the grieving and the mental perceptions of I haven't done enough, I haven't said the right things uh, on time. So I think we we um we have the tools, but we also have to do our own work. And um, it just came to my mind recently. I've I've mentioned in our group that I've signed up to Mirabai Stars Workshop on the Divine Feminine, and uh, it was interesting because uh, I think it was in the first video that somebody asked, "How do you deal with all the with all the things that are happening and i think the person is actually working in the hospital who asked um mirabai how do you use that divine feminine and i think our automatic response would be like a disassociation of from the situation but for her mirabai with her work and understanding deep understanding of the divine feminine she actually responded quite differently um she said uh, she said she also works a lot in with the refugees because she speaks spanish and she says you know if i if i was putting defenses i would never be able to do that kind of work because uh, families are grieving um uh, you know and they're not living in the best conditions and so she says what you have to actually be able to prepare to do with the divine feminine principle is to have your heart broken every time oh. but then find find time for yourself to have a sabbath that was actually a, um on that uh, that that was a module on that tradition but basically she said a day for yourself when you re re regenerate when you spend it for self-care and when she said that, I was like, oh, I think, you know, when you have clients, you kind of, you, you are there for them. But there is, I've, I've realized that I do have unconscious defenses coming from disassociation that probably don't allow the flow of people, more people in need to come to me because I'm like, <laughs> 
can I handle that? Can I not? But in mm. fact, her advice of, as a, I'm saying it as a therapist, to don't be afraid to have your heart broken every time. This is the divine feminine perspective. And when we have our kids, we don't dissociate. <laughs> don't tell me about your bubbles, your traumas. You know, we're out there to help them. And this is how the divine principle works. And I thought it was interesting that it actually brought out some yeah, unconscious, unconscious things mm -hmm. in me that I think I'll be more, more open and not afraid and um, not, not dissociate, but rather take time for self-care. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. 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 I share one thing? Okay. No, thank you. I just want to say something that um, Jana started on saying. I've had a lot of um, broken hearts over the years and grief and loss. Um, and every time I thought I will not be able to survive. But the thing is, I found out that I actually get um, more open to life and to finding little joys uh, hidden in the little, little things. And it helps finding out that there is there is no real loss, you know, all the, the, the people that we kind of um, lose over the years are just there. And we, we are meant to continue this, this life and this contract and this um, celebration in a way, because it's all, all life and death. It's just doors, right? Opening. So little joys help, help I think. That's it. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Nora, for adding this. One more thing that she said, when you open your heart, you don't open it only for compassion and grief, but for a lot of joy. And she said, the, the hope and the uh, little things that people bring into their, you know, she learns a lot. Not, she's not just getting grief. She says, when you open your heart, you open yourself for the, all the richness of the personality. And you learn a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so shall we shift? Paul is just saying we should shift into joy. And we would like to unmute everybody because a very, very special someone who's sitting under the elephant, kind of, <laughs> under, under some bird flying to the elephant, has almost a birthday. Our dear friend Bruce has his birthday, and if you would join us singing him a happy birthday, that would really be wonderful. You're the singer. I'm the singer, okay. <laughs> okay. One, two, and a one, two, three. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Hey, speech, speech. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Bruce. Wishing you a good, wonderful year. Stay healthy and well. And yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. All. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for doing this. Well, uh, the 15th we have to skip yeah next friday we have to skip but we'll be back the friday after yeah in two weeks yeah. tomorrow From nora there. is holding a wine party wine oh boy tea party. <laughs> we should do that for when is it 2 p.m 8 p.m 8 p.m italy time oh um at 7 p.m in portugal okay bye yeah bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh. Bye. 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 Bye